Chapters four to seven of Tristram Shandy, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shalifa Mulligan. The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, Gentleman, Volume three, by Lawrence Stern. Chapter four, and lastly. For all the choice anecdotes which history can produce of this matter, continued my father, this, like the gilded dome which covers in the fabric, crowns all. Tis of Cornelius Callus, the praetor, which I dare say, Brother Toby, you have read. I dare say I have not, replied my uncle. He died, said my father, as... "'And if it was with his wife,' said Michael Toby, "'there could be no hurt in it.' "'That's more than I know,' replied my father. CHAPTER V My mother was going very gingerly in the dark, along the passage, which led to the parlour, as my uncle Toby pronounced the word wife. "'Tis a shrill penetrating sound of itself, and Obadiah had helped it, by leaving the door a little ajar, so that my mother heard enough of it to imagine herself the subject of the conversation. So laying the edge of her finger across her two lips, holding in her breath, and bending her head a little downwards, with a twist of her neck, not towards the door, but from it, by which means her ear was brought to the chink, she listened with all her powers. The listening slave— with the goddess of silence at his back, could not have given a finer thought for an intaglio. In this attitude I am determined to let her stand for five minutes, till I bring up the affairs of the kitchen, as Raven does of those of the church, to the same period. CHAPTER Six. Though, in one sense, our family was certainly a simple machine, as it consisted of a few wheels, yet there was thus much to be said for it, that these wheels were set in motion by so many different springs, and acted one upon the other, from such a variety of strange principles and impulses, that, though it was a simple machine, it had all the honour and advantages of a complex one and a number of as odd movements within it, as ever were beheld in the inside of a Dutch silk mill. Among these there was one, I am going to speak of, in which perhaps it was not altogether so singular as in many others, and it was at this, that, whatever motion, debate, harangue, dialogue, project, or dissertation, was going forward in the parlour, there was generally another at the same time, and upon the same subject, running parallel along with it in the kitchen. Now, to bring this about, whenever an extraordinary message or letter was delivered in the parlour, or a discourse suspended till a servant went out, or the lines of a discontent were observed to hang upon the brows of my father or mother, or, in short, when anything was supposed to be upon this tape as worth knowing or listening to, it was the rule to leave the door not absolutely shut, but somewhat ajar, as it stands just now, which, under covert of the bad hinge, and that possibly might be one of the many reasons why it was never mended, it was not difficult to manage, by which means, in all these cases, a passage was generally left, not indeed as wide as a dardanelle's, but wide enough for all that, to carry on as much of this windward trade as was sufficient to save my father the trouble of governing his house. My mother at this moment stands profiting by it. Obadiah did the same thing. As soon as he had left the letter upon the table which brought the news of my brother's death, so that before my father had well got over his surprise and entered upon his harangue, had Trim got upon his legs to speak his sentiments upon the subject. A curious observer of nature, had he been worth the inventory of all job stock, though by the by your curious observers are seldom worth a crowd, would have given the half of it 
to have heard Corporal Trim and my father, two orators so contrasted by nature and education, haranguing over the same beer. My father, a man of deep reading, prompt memory, with Cato and Seneca and Epictetus, at his finger-ends. The corporal, with nothing, to remember of no deep reading, than his musteral, or greater names at his finger-ends, than the contents of it. The one proceeding from period to period, by metaphor and allusion, and striking the fancy as he went along, as men of wit and fancy do, with the entertainment and pleasantry of his pictures and images. The other, without wit or antithesis, or point or turn, this way or that, but leaving the images on one side and the picture on the other, going straight forwards as nature could lead him, to the heart. O oh, Trim, would to heaven thou hadst a better historian! Would thy historian had a better pair of breeches! O oh, ye critics, will nothing mount you! Chapter 7 "'My young master in London is dead,' said Obadiah. A green satin nightgown of my mother's, which had been twice scoured, was the first idea which Obadiah's exclamation brought into Susanna's head. Well might Locke write a chapter upon the imperfections of words. Then, quoth Susanna, we must all go into mourning. But note, a second time the word mourning, notwithstanding Susanna made use of it herself, failed also doing its office. It excited not one single idea, tinged either with grey or black. All was green. The green satin nightgown hung there still. "'Oh, it will be the death of my poor mistress!' cried Susanna. My mother's whole wardrobe followed. What a procession! A red damask, her orange tawny, her white and yellow lute strings, her brown taffeta, her bone-laced caps, her bed-gowns, and comfortable under-petticoats. Not a rag was left behind. "'No, she will never look up again,' said Susanna. "'We had a fat, foolish scullion. My father, I think, kept her for her simplicity. She had been all autumn struggling with the dropsy. "'He is dead,' said Obadiah. "'He is certainly dead.' "'So am not I,' said the foolish scullion. "'Here is sad news, Trim,' cried Susanna, wiping her eyes as Trim stepped into the kitchen. "'Master Bobby is dead and buried.' The funeral was an interpolation of Susanna's. "'We shall have all to go into mourning,' said Susanna. "'I hope not,' said Trim. "'You hope not?' cried Susanna earnestly. The morning ran not in Trim's head, whatever it did in Susanna's. "'I hope,' said Trim, explaining himself, "'I hope in God the news is not true. "'I heard the letter read with my own ears,' answered Obadiah. "'And we shall have a terrible piece of work of it in stubbing the ox more. "'Oh, he's dead,' said Susanna. "'As sure,' said the scullion, "'as I'm alive.' "'I lament for him from my heart and my soul,' said Trim, fetching a sigh. "'Poor creature! Poor boy! Poor gentleman!' "'He was alive last Whitsuntide,' said the coachman. "'Whitsuntide, alas!' cried Trim, extending his right arm, and falling instantly into the same attitude in which he read the sermon. "'What is Whitsuntide, Jonathan?' for that was the coachman's name, or Shroftide, or any tide or time past, to this. Are we not here now? continued the corporal, striking the end of his stick perpendicularly upon the floor, so as to give an idea of health and stability. And are we not, dropping his hat upon the ground, gone, in a moment? It was infinitely striking. Susanna burst into a flood of tears. We are not stocks and stones. Jonathan, Obadiah, the cook-maid, all melted. The foolish fat scullion herself, 
who was carrying a fish kettle upon her knees, was roused with it. The whole kitchen crowded about the corporal. Now, as I perceive plainly that the preservation of our constitution in church and state, and possibly the preservation of the whole world, or what is the same thing, the distribution and balance of its property and power, may in time to come depend greatly upon the right understanding of this stroke of the corporal's eloquence, I do demand your attention, your worships and reverences, for any ten pages together, take them where you will in any other part of the work, shall sleep for it at your ease. I said, we were not stocks and stones. This very well, I should have added. Nor are we angels. I wish we were. But men clothed with bodies, and governed by our imaginations, and what a junketing piece of work of it there is, betwixt these and our seven senses, especially some of them. For my own part, I own it, I am ashamed to confess." Let it suffice to affirm that of all the senses, the eye, for I absolutely denied the touch, though most of your babati I know are for it, has the quickest comers with the soul, gives the smartest stroke, and leaves something more inexpressible upon the fancy than words can either convey or sometimes get rid of. I've gone a little about, no matter it is for health, let us only carry it back in our mind to the mortality of Trim's head. Are we not here now, and gone, in a moment? There was nothing in the sentence. It was one of your self-evident truths we have the advantage of hearing every day. And if Trim had not trusted more to his head than his head, he made nothing at all of it. Are we not here now? continued the corporal, and are we not, dropping his hat plumb upon the ground, and pausing before he pronounced the word, gone, in a moment? The descent of the hat was as if a heavy lump of clay had been kneaded into the crown of it. Nothing could have expressed the sentiment of mortality, of which it was the type and forerunner, like it. His hand seemed to vanish from under it. It fell dead, the corporal's eye fixed upon it, as upon a corpse, and Susanna burst into a flood of tears. Now, ten thousand, and ten thousand times ten thousand, for matter and motion are infinite, are the ways by which a hat may be dropped upon the ground without any effect. Had he flung it, or thrown it, or cast it, or skimmed it, or squirted it, or let it slip or fall in any possible direction under heaven, or in the best direction that could be given to it, had he dropped it like a goose, like a puppy, like an ass, or in doing it, or even after he had done, had he looked like a fool, like a ninny, like a nincompoop, it had failed and the effect upon the heart had been lost. Ye who govern this mighty world, and its mighty concerns with the engines of eloquence, who heat it, and cool it, and melt it, and mollify it, and then harden it again to your purpose, ye who wind and turn the passions with its great windlers, and having done it lead the owners of them, whither ye think meet, ye lastly who drive, and why not, ye also who are driven, like Turkish to market with a stick and a red cloud, meditate, meditate, I beseech you, upon Drim's hat. End of chapters 4 to 7